Welcome to Arkham Postcast, where we discuss productivity, self-hosting, career professionalism, and innovative technology. Here to bring you the latest from the open source ecosystem and beyond is yours truly, Andrew Syriac, and with me is my co-host, Jack Moore. How are you doing today, Jack? I am doing well over here. I know we have a uh, shorter episode planned for today, so I'm just kind of getting ready for uh, all this material we got to get through and uh, kind of excited for today's show. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm I'm doing good. I'm thinking about that intro, uh, and I think that that intro is really held up. Uh, I think we really do kind of talk about productivity, self-hosting, uh, career professionalism, professionalism and innovative technology um and and i i like saying that when we get ready to do this show um because i i think it just like kind of I'm, I'm able to step into the mood i'm able to 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 get ready and 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 come to the table i'm like all right now i'm sitting down now i'm starting the show and we're getting ready to do this and uh and 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 i put put my game face on so uh i've i've really liked how that's that's held up uh and how and how we've we've stuck to that I love it. I agree. And I think that is a great kickoff right into this first article here, which is the uh, five diagrams that show how context switching saps your productivity. I'll tell you what, it's been happening to me a lot at work lately, just so much context switching. And I was going through the article and one of the points was, have you ever finished a work week in a state of total exhaustion, but you weren't sure why? Well, guess what? This is probably why just doing all this context switching, but I don't know if you want to jump into this article, dive into kind of how it goes over basically context switching. We all know it. It's not good. But yeah. And I think, and I this... think yeah, and I, th- I think that's a good summary of it, you know, where where we talk about people know what work is, right? And and they know they come home from work exhausted, right? But what really is sapping, you know, their, their energy? And Obviously, we know meetings are a huge energy sap, but in in what kind of way? Uh, I think the the article does a good job of of analyzing kind of how we can go about approaching different topics. Uh, and yes, you did hear right, guys. This is a di- an article about five different diagrams, you know, which we Correct. decided to discuss on an audio only podcast. Uh, so uh, bear with us as we go through this. But the the diagrams uh, aren't aren't necessarily that complex, uh, really. Uh, it's it's a bar graph with with three bars, right? And and each of them representing a topic, uh, and then we we go from low to high, with low being the really the in depth, the the tactical part of things, and and the high part of it being like strategy. So so really, we're just taking a look at at, at three bars here and kind of imagining them as as individual topics. The author's main point that she's trying to make here is that. The further down we get into the tactical part of any given topic, the more difficult it is and the more energy sapping it is to then context switch to a different topic. Uh, Totally. So uh, she says you're moving between strategy and tactics for a single topic is generally not that tasking. And often happens naturally as I discuss document or do. I'm switching tasks, but I'm focusing on one broad idea, right? So that would be the one, the one topic. So we're going between, you know, high level strategy or we're diving really into the weeds uh, about something or other, whatever topic that is. This is written by uh, Ashley Foss, by the way, uh, with Atlassian. Uh, so Atlassian's coming out um, uh, and, and, and going through this, this context switching problem that we all seem to have. Uh, she also kind of states that it's not really uh, that difficult to move between topics as long as we're staying at the same depth of thinking, right? So if we're if we're staying on the the surface level strategy side of things, it's really easy to start hopping from topic to topic to topic, right? The issue becomes when you're changing both the topic and the depth that you're getting into that topic. So if you you go really far into the weeds on one topic and then immediately have to turn around and discuss an entirely different aspect of what you need to do or or totally different topic, whatever, uh, then that becomes mentally taxing. And that is the most jarring type of context switch uh, that you're doing. And then 
Uh, this is the, by far my, my favorite diagram. She shows how she goes from really in the weeds on her first topic uh, to a very high level strategy on the second topic and then immediately to a third topic where she has to cover both the strategy and the in-depth planning for that topic. That is a lot of context switching and that is a lot of uh, really cognitive load that you have to take on to be able to, to hop between that and really load that in. Think of it you know, as loading something in from swap, I mean from RAM you're you're going to have a long time of, of processing that and of bringing it back in right before you can really get a good handle on everything that you need to be in in there and then needing to discard that immediately and go into something go deep into something uh, is going to be mentally task taxing so this isn't an all doom and gloom article though uh, Ashley does bring in a couple of um, she says revelations uh, from her living lab experiment where she she went through this. So her recommendation is batching tasks may not work for everyone. Uh, so the uh, former attempts to bucket time into distinct compartments with strict separation to keep things in balance. Uh, that isn't that isn't necessarily something that's advantageous for her. Uh, she turns out uh, has, has found herself out to be more of an integrator. Uh, so it turns out that attempting to batch her day into discrete topics or depths actually caused her to feel more stress and at times bored, right? So, so keeping to that kind of rigid, I'm going to set a schedule and I'm only going to do these things at this schedule, right? Caused her anxiety. And, and I can see that too, right? You're, you're holding your future self enslaved to, you know, your past decision. That is the complete opposite of being agile, right? That you, you see that in big laborious companies, not something that's supposed to be agile. I'll tell you what though. I do like, I have, sometimes I have to do that. Sometimes I have to sit down and say, these are the things that need to get done. I'm going to put them on my calendar to make sure I do them. And <laughs> Maybe that's work visibility, though, which is brought up later, it which is. I think is definitely part of it. Yeah. It's, but it's, I won't hold myself to, rigid to the schedule, but I will hold myself kind of like a, hey, you know, these things can be moved around, but you should probably do them today at some point. Yeah. And, and bringing greater visibility to your work. Uh, she references David Allen's getting things done method, uh, which, you know, you, you can look at any kind of productivity solution. It's going to borrow bits and pieces from that. Um, you know, you and I, Jack, we love kind of uh, board driven project management, you know, the, the process improvement. Uh, so that's also a, a good thing to do. Um, she also says uh, here, number three under her strategies to try practice honest prioritization, right? Um, how are you going to allocate your mental, physical, and emotional energy? The way I've, I've found to be most honest about that is to say, what have I previously been able to get done, right? And using estimation, whether that be complexity, whether that be story points, whether that be, you know, uh, estimated hours to completion, right? That's a way that I can honestly say, all right, I can get probably 20 to 25 uh, hours worth of estimated, you know, work time done in a week, Um so over budgeting me is not going to work out. Uh, and, and, and I can be honest about that. And I can say, look, you know, I, I, I could, I could say I'm going to do all these things. I could, I could come to the table with, with the greatest of intentions to do all these things. But in the end, I know, you know, historically, unless I pull a Herculean feat, which let's be honest, this is just work. We're not, we're not trying to prove our worth to anyone here. Right. Um, we're probably not going to get that done, especially week after week after week. Uh, so practicing honest prioritization here, I think, is also a really good takeaway. Uh, one that was unexpected, but I think it it, it really was able to round out uh, her strategies here. Uh, any thoughts on anything else in this article? No, I do love that we continue to bring uh, pictures and picture-based articles to the podcast. I will mention that. I think <laughs> that was that was my fault. I got so enamored with it, I just had to bring it in. Um, I, 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 nothing else to add. I was going to say the one thing I did love was the uh, first strategy to try, which is visualize your work, and I think that brings a great. It just allows you to see what's right in front of you and what's in, what you need to do and what you have to do. Um, but nothing else stuck out from the article. Nothing stuck out from the article except. It, it's not going away. Context switching is not going away. It's there. You just have to be 
cognizant of it. No, no, and it's not, and it's not in your uh, per- professional life, and it's not in your personal life uh, either. Uh, one thing uh, that Ryan Patterson uh, did in his personal life, though, that I picked up on this week, uh, was creating his own personal cloud with HashiCorp. Right. Um, he he goes into uh, our next article here about everything he has. Um, he said for the past few years, uh, the VPS that he he uses to self-host has been managed with Docker Compose. Uh, but recently he went on to try something a little bit bigger. Uh, he had a couple of requirements here. Uh, there are a couple interesting ones that I'm going to get into uh, later on, but uh, at at the beginning and, and, and really the meat of this is him walking through how he configures his services um, using different shell scripts and HashiCorp tools, so uh, Terraform uh, and uh, their vault, I believe, somewhere in here. Um, he... Okay, so he touches on Pulumi yep. here, which is which is a newcomer to the space, uh, if anyone's new. So it's, it's kind of like a, a Terraform-ish uh, type of, of solution. I think day two cloud had a podcast interview with the creator of the software that really kind of goes into depth on, on how it does what it does, how it provides abstractions like they have Python, uh, you know, or, or JavaScript or, or whatever to be able to do things in different clouds. And, uh, they, they have an interesting approach that I believe tries to be more agnostic than Terraform does. But don't quote me on that. Uh, definitely go look into it for yourself. Uh, me, I'm still, I, I'm still going to prefer Ansible. Uh, I, I, I think above everything else, um, especially how it does just integrate so well with Docker Compose. You know, it has that that. Um, well, it has a Docker Compose module which I had to hack a workaround to, which I'm going to get into in a moment here. Uh, but but going through, he he talks about uh, how he feels about it six months in, right? Um, and and I love this. He's he says to me the best test of my personal projects are if they are still usable after six months of use. And yeah. I love that he comes to it with that idea because a lot of these, uh, you know, one clip one click app deployments or these you know spin up x service you know in five minutes a lot of these don't come to the table with all right how's it going to work six six months in how are backups working how's resiliency working you know and and for that i think you really do need someone who thinks in that infrastructure point of view you really do need someone who is concerned about what is and and they call this like a a a day two mindset right so like day one's installing it's set up everything's pristine and beautiful and perfect and and ready for work and then day two what happens when you get your first error message what happens when you get your first alert you know and 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 so on and so forth Uh, so i am glad to see here that he he really does follow up with this. And he points out some of the next steps that he'd like to focus on. Um, The first one, he says, scaling up to multiple machines is the obvious one. He says he'd like to be able to automatically scale up different machine configuration based on the job specs that he's running. Uh, For instance, he wants to be able to deploy a batch job that requires a GPU instance and have the instance created and deployed, uh, destroyed automatically. Uh, So that is... That is the point where you go beyond, I'm just going to be running something on a server, and that can be fairly agnostic down to the level where you can actually have it running um, on your own disconnected instance, to something like, I'm going to have to hard code stuff about my infrastructure provider, I'm going to have to externalize some, some of my dependencies, right? They're going to be inevitably linked together with whatever I'm using, whereas something like R Compose is going to be kind of limited to one server in the sense that, yes, this is able to be spun up either on one server or maybe even a cluster, right? But stuff that does stuff like this programmatically, that would mean the the application itself is going to be making calls to the infrastructure, um, if not to like a command and control server. Uh, So there there are a couple things there that I think are couple couple things too closely for 
my liking for for a project that's that's mostly open source but if you're spinning up like a personal cloud you know you just kind of want this thing to work you look at um the self-hosted subreddit you have plenty of people who are just self-hosting you know the crap out of whatever they want to do you know and they have all these beautiful dashboards and it's it's just you know it's my favorite unix porn subreddit because it's it's beautiful it's it's really beautiful they do a great job with these, but that's not what I'm looking to do. I think with our compose, uh, I'm trying to keep it simple and, and flexible where he's, he's kind of making decisions um, or, or looking at making decision, which is going to tie him into, to an ecosystem as well. Uh, now this is an interesting one. He says also scaling services to zero is another project I'd like to try. He says, basically I'd want to automatically shut down certain jobs that aren't receiving web traffic and automatically start them up when they get a request similar to how Heroku works. Um, he says he hasn't seen any self-hosted implementations of this, but has some ideas around how it can be accomplished. So I'm going to be watching him to see if he, what he comes up with uh, for this. And, and cause that's a very interesting thought process. And in, in, as far as scaling something down to zero, that allows you to free up resources for other applications, especially in our composes case where you have everything running on one box, one instance, right? So uh, very interesting to see him spin all this stuff up. And, and this just kind of reinforces, you know, Ryan, Ryan here is reinforcing my thought process here is that people want their own servers, right? They just want to, um, they, they, they don't want to be a part of a, you know, a mob, Right, a mob right. that's using the mob that uses Google, the mob that uses Treble, Trello. You know, they they want to use their their services, and and open source is perfect for that, right? So I I firmly believe that with with uh, R Compose too, and you know I I hope that by getting R Compose off the ground that we can help these pers- you know individual creators do this with also the services that we use. I mean, that's that's the beauty of open source. It's just the many different ways they can, they can be used. Yeah, we're providing that solution. And speaking of, I loved this next one here, which was the uh, which CRM, basically, right? CMS, what, what, content what management CMS? system. Yeah, what, yeah, yeah. Detect CMS? which CMS your, a site is using. And this one was pretty smart. I ran a couple websites in it thinking, oh, it's probably going to be like, answering WordPress or, you know, Drupal or Joomla or a handful of these. It's pretty smart. It knows, hey, this is Google. Hey, this is Ruby returning this. Hey, this is whatever. So I was impressed by it. Uh, We dropped a link in the show notes, but basically it's a pretty quick and dirty detect what CMS is running on the site. Uh, I don't know if you had anything you wanted to add to that as well. Just as far as my personal use case of this, I, I use it a lot when I... Uh, I have found myself actually using it a lot when I stumble across a forum that I like, like a like a forum software that that I think, oh, this is this looks really cool, this looks neat, and I'm trying to figure out, you know, what are you using on the back end here? This site will be able to give me, you know, oh, this is uh, what's the what, what's what's discourse, right? This is discourse, or this is uh, PHP BB, or you know, what whatever's. Uh, whatever's being being run on the back end. So so that that's been really cool for me to say, oh, I didn't know that could look like that and and just kind of opened up the possibilities uh, for what we could provide as a forum solution were we to want to do something like that. Now, and actually that's that's interesting. So I've been thinking about that type of solution and thinking, you know, what if we just did like a question and answer, board like i i was looking at manjaro's i was looking at shot cuts you know all these little, little you know smaller projects bulletin boards they all seem to be basically like help support you know stuff like that there's not a whole lot of side discussion going on it's it's a lot of a lot of support there um so i'm wondering if not like a stack overflow type of a site wouldn't be more engaging or you know wouldn't be more suited for that kind of response were we to spin something up like an internal um site for our compose to use so like just some form type yeah yeah ra- rather than a form have like a have like a q a like a like a self-hosted quora or self-hosted stack overflow or i i and i don't know if that's possible i don't know if that's out there but just kind of in the back of my mind i've been chewing on that
Well, we do have a few news and community updates as we uh, kind of move along here. Uh, sure. These are quick. None of them really, truthfully to me, none of them stuck out except for one, which I'll kind of discuss here. Uh, but just kind of going through Vault Warden 1.23.0 was released. Uh, basically, there is a now allowed an emergency access flag that you can pass in. I guess this is just in case you lose your master password or what have you. I'm going to have to look into that one to get more details on what that emergency access looks like. That's almost kind of a scary thought, but <laughs> we'll, we'll leave it. Yeah, there's been Unless, there's yeah. been a lot of discussion in that in the IRC room in, in chat in Matrix. Uh, so I am interested as well to look into that. It looks like a, a feature that a lot of people were requesting. Uh, so if if everyone wants it, I'm I'm assuming they're going to do it in a secure type manner, but definitely something worth looking into. That was a major feature I kind of saw. And then the other one for this 1.23 was the uh, a database connection check uh, to the alive route, basically, endpoint. So, bas- so it sounds like you're able to check if the database connection is there on this endpoint, which is an awesome feature. Just basically saying, hey, yep, the database is online we're able to connect uh and moving along here we do have book stack dan brown just added again i didn't get to add his video in. he did post a great youtube video on setting up an instance of book stack which is out there but this week he did have another release uh on the november 1st for security and it's really he's just plugging away at kind of the same issue of users with permissions uh being able to kind of cross-site script and ha- basically essentially hack the uh, book stack. But um, this week's release, it was a lot on, I believe, the hosting of pictures and blobs and images like that. So mm-hmm. uh, still working, I guess, towards mitigating that. But good to see that work is still being done. And then... I'm gonna skip ahead to skip ahead here to Sweet CRM 7.12. As you know, we are talking about that today, so an exciting one. But in this one, it looks like they added support for Elasticsearch 7, and then there was uh, another important update here. It looked like a PDF engine was a new default, so kind of exciting. Uh, I've, I'm excited to hear what you have to say on sweet CRM today, but I did want to save this kind of last and kind of my favorite, uh, piece of news here or update from the next cloud team, continuing to push the boundaries forward with their peer to peer backup app is now available for testing. I saw it was an alpha. Uh, so that is beta, excuse me, that is out there now and available and, I, don't call me web three. I'm not going to get, I'm not, I'm not, <laughs> I don't want to get, I don't want to say decentralized, but you, you throw out the words peer to peer backup. I mean, that's kind of what it comes to mind. Don't know if you have any takes on that one. No, I, I hadn't looked into this. Honestly, I just, uh, glanced right over it. Um, the, the title seems intriguing. I'm wondering, uh, what, what does it actually do? Uh, I'll read a, couple things here it's uh store you can store backups on obviously another next cloud server uh the other server can but doesn't have to have the backup app installed which is kind of an interesting one that just kind of means does that mean you're just gonna store this on someone else's server without them knowing without me knowing uh you can store backups on external storage like you know F- ftp smb web dev uh, and any other NextCloud supported protocol, you can also store them on a local drive. Fine. It's really, to me, it looks like it's based around backup um, with this one feature installed within, if that makes sense. So, so basically, they're prov- providing users a way to do encrypted backups from the UI, which is fine. Um, and right. then you get to do that and throw it wherever you want. Um, and, and also, I don't know if you've ever done federated sharing over an Xcloud server, but it's like a two way handshake. You have to send it to the other server to a specific user. 
And then the specific user on that account has to accept it before it will be added. So you can't just like throw data onto someone else's server. I would hope not. I would hope not. You would you would have to have to send a request there. And I'm assuming this is going to be something uh, similar, similar to, that. to that. Yeah. No, but that's cool. Note, the backup app requires quite some free storage. When a full backup is made, a complete copy of NextCloud and its data is made, after which this gets compressed and encrypted and stored on the designated backup system. This is actually the same issue I was running into when I was trying to design, you know, what, what can Arcanpost do for, for backups? I'm, I'm looking at this and like, all right, if you have over 50% disk utilization, right, how am I supposed to, because because right now, the way we back up is we stream the tar we, we, we stream over SCP and we're tarballing it as it goes across the wire. Because you can you can you can pipe the tarball into SCP and then SCP will will pipe the bits uh, uh, over uh, to they, the remote yeah. server as you go, right? So you don't actually store anything on disk as you're backing up. Whereas this solution is doing just that, they need at least 50% disk, and probably more than that if we're being honest, free, uh, in order to to back up everything. So they, they did take that approach. So I think that's going to be the biggest pain point um, and, and learning hurdle when people go to use this and say, oh, you can't do it, you don't have enough free storage. Oh, how much free storage do I need? Well, double what you have right now. <laughs> Add in two more discs, basically. <laughs> exactly. Uh, so th- that is a caveat to be aware of, I would say. Uh, and it is only available for Nextcloud 23. So that uh, a final release is planned to coincide with the Nextcloud release later this year. Yeah, t- Nextcloud 23 is still in beta as well. So this is this is cutting edge what they're rolling out here. Um, but it, it shows where they're thinking. They're thinking end-to-end encrypted. You know, all the smart kids are doing it. I would agree with that. And I don't know. I I, I wanted to use that uh, Web3 as a jump in here uh, for this, for all the, some art Compose developments, but I don't, I don't know if you want to call it Web3 or uh, decentralized with the peer-to-peer Talk backups. Talk about peer-to-peer. But peer, the, peer, the, I was going to say. The, the granddaddy of peer well not the grant there are plenty of granddaddies but the most prominent peer-to-peer protocol i think that is in the news these days is is going to be bitcoin and i got bit by the bitcoin bug a while ago uh and have been kind of trouncing along you know and and, and just kind of being fairly passive about it um but recently i decided to spin up my own full node uh and i i wanted to do that like the sysadmins of old. I wanted to sit down and say, hey, I'm going to install an OS on bare metal. And, uh, you know, I'm going to put that in my data center. I call it, it's a corner of my room, but my data center. Uh, and it's it's going to be running. And uh, I'm going to I'm gonna set up systemd timers. You know, I'm going to uh, compile everything from source and install a user local bin and user local, you know, uh, lib and, and, and all that. And, you know, I was just, just kind of going through all this and, and ran into like, it wasn't even Roblox. It was just like little, you know, just, just like, like minor inefficiencies, you know, along the way, like, oh, he's setting up a system D service. It took me like two hours to like, all right, does this work? Does that work the way I thought it? Does that work? You know, by the end of it, I was like, you know what I could do? I've written this entire stack of software that sets up an entire, you know, workable server, uh, as long as you have a Docker compose file. And I hopped on hopped on chat and sure enough that day someone had posted oh did anyone see these docker compose files for for bitcoin i was like well that i i have to now reevaluate my entire you know life's decisions and um so i i, I just reinstalled ubuntu on the thing and uh and and ran our compose against it and then started working on uh spinning up bitcoin d on it now the problem with that is that when you start bitcoin d it starts and it runs for 
hours. I think mine ran for like 17 hours before it had downloaded the entirety of the blockchain and stored it on oh disk. Oh my gosh. Um, it, it ended up being like 260 gigs or something like that. So it's it's not unreasonable, right? Uh, so it, it downloaded everything, put it on disk. And I'm like, all right, that's great. And then I tried to restart it and it corrupted. I was like, what's what's going on with this? What? What, what, what's happening um and I, I was trying new things you know left and right too i'm trying to put it in as as a service and i'm trying to you know have the volumes mounted correctly and, and yada 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 what ended up happening is i ran into once again ansible's docker compose restart bug where whenever you pass restarted true to a container that is not yet spun up it will restart the container that you're spinning up for the very first time after the timeout that you specify um, defaulted to 10 seconds. And you can't pass zero because zero is not an integer, apparently. Zero is a bool to them. Okay, whatever. So you can't pass zero. You cannot pass go. You cannot collect $200. So, <laughs> so I couldn't raise the timeout to 17 hours because that would be ridiculous. Like if it, it was having problems shut down, I would want it force killed. But I, I, I can't I can't set a timeout that ridiculously high. So what do I do? Uh, so what I ended up doing uh, as as far as a workaround uh, was the first thing I did is I tested to see if the container that I was going to spin up is, is there in the first place. And if it is, then feel free to restart it for me, please and thank you, because that's what our Compose is trying to do, is trying to give it a kick so that it can, you know, fix any issues that it's been having or, or, or just get it going again. But if it's not there, do not pass that restarted parameter, otherwise that timeout's going to kick in. So I'm, I'm now avoiding that restart parameter uh, every time I call Docker Compose if that container is not present. Uh, so that avoids that restarted uh, bug. Um, and then there was also another thing I ran into our compose specific where we do the bind mount points where it was trying to mount dev mapper uh, LV root or something like that. It was, it was one of the logical volumes and it works in dev mapper. Well, the container didn't even have the dev mapper directory. So when I try to mount dev mapper device, on dev mapper, it was like no it's, such file or directory. I can't find dev mapper. Right. And I'm racking my brain like, what, what's going on here? Of course, you, you know, dev is there. The block device is there. What's going on? Well, it didn't create the directory. It didn't create dev mapper. So I had to go in and say, all right, let's double check to make sure that all the necessary directories are created before we try to mount the block device special. So that was that was fun. Um, once I was able to get through that and I got Bitcoin started up without it shutting down, getting hard killed in the first 10 seconds of its lifetime, uh, it was able to spin up. I was down, able to download the, the entire, uh, Bitcoin cash, uh, blockchain. And, uh, just as to, to reiterate the point, I mean, Bitcoin cash is Bitcoin, uh, and it, it's proven in the PDF linked here. Um, if you've never read the white paper, and yes, I am so sick of everyone and their mother putting out white papers anymore. Uh, this is the OG white paper uh, whose totality of the nine pages uh, accounts for one entire page of references and one entire page of an introduction. So there's no excuse not for you not to just like stop this podcast right now and go read this. It is, it is the most readable white paper I promise you've ever seen come out of academia. Cause I, I don't think it did, but that's, that's a, that's a story from a different time who Satoshi Nakamoto really is. But I was able to get that downloaded. Uh, and uh, I did have it running uh, for a week or so. Uh, unfortunately, I just, I started to get my hands into some, some other projects and I, I just started like going down the rabbit hole and, and cause this is such a really interesting time for Bitcoin cash, uh, especially with smart BCH coming out. Uh, if you don't know what that is, Google it. Uh, it's a, uh, it's an EVM compatible side chain, which just 
you know, blows everything else out of the water. It's, this is great. This is, this is so great. So I'm happy that that came out and I wanted to get stuff like up and running on it. I just don't have the time because I'm starting to put in all these Docker services on that server. I'm like, I can literally plug and play anything I want in here. Right. So I'm doing this left and right to the detriment of the other stuff I'm supposed to do, like record videos, so prep for podcast notes, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, I, I took a step back from that and said, all right, let me, let me try to focus here first. And then if I, if something else eases up, then I'm, I'm going to go back and, and I'm going to see what I can't update there. I'm going to have a couple more blocks to pull down, I'm sure, but um, I think that'll be okay. That's awesome. And then, I don't know, speaking of uh, things ramping up on the technical side, we do have now a Compositional Enterprises blog, which we are posting most of our technical posts to now. So that's out there. It's linked in the podcast. Would highly recommend checking it out. I believe the we do have two posts. We have an intro post up, and I believe we have, I, I think I might need to run Compositional Roll on the Arc Compose instance, but we should have a second post out there showing kind of how to develop on Arc Compose. Now, most of these are going to start to be general, but had to had to put that shill in there for the uh, Compositional Enterprises first. So be on the lookout for that.